Hi all on PlayChess and streaming to YouTube. I'm sorry I didn't mention it uh, uh, beforehand. It's, it's usually every Tuesday anyway. If you if you uh, you can assume that most Tuesdays, uh, apart from in December when I have December off, uh, and when I have club matches occasionally as well. But other than that, most Tuesdays there'll be a live broadcast. Uh, so on this channel, and I will be focused on Bobby Fisher uh, for the next few weeks actually. So we're going to look at the last three games of the 1970 Interzonal in Palma de Mallorca. I hope you have got something from the games so far. Um, I, I think it might be worth at some point revision points on the strategic points from the games because I think there's a lot to learn from Fisher's style of chess. It was very, very accurate and precise, um, for example. And um, yeah, okay, so the last three games, if we join in round 21, he was playing against the Brazilian uh, Henrique Mecking. So let's have a look. And actually, this is very, very interesting because Fischer actually kicked off this game with B3. And maybe this somehow, this might have influenced Nakamura. He plays B3 a lot, especially in rapid events in the London Classic uh, last year. Uh, Nakamura was playing B3 against like Vichy Anand, so, so maybe some influence here. So a little surprise weapon from Fischer playing against Mecking. So Bishop B2, C5. Now Fischer plays Knight F3. Um, you might think this is like blocking the F pawn. Sometimes in this position, uh, if you want a dark square grip, sometimes e3 and then f4 is played, then knight f3. But Fisher's using knight f3, knight c6, e3. Uh, you can see that the point of this is to try and pin the knight here, and that will increase the influence on the e5 square. So it's a kind of it's a Nimzo Indian in reverse, with white having an extra tempo, of course. You see with that pin, it's the classic Nimzo Indian style trying to exert influence on the central square e5 so black just responds with nothing special knight f6 so we have bishop b5 and not not very adventurous actually i'll just connect to live book here it's it's been played before a lot at call it's live but bishop d7 here just unpinning avoiding the double pawns which could have arisen now uh, we see uh, castling e6 so as a nimzo engine reverse this is this is very very interesting white has a plan now and uh, not to play d4 you might think d4 to exert more influence on e5 directly but rather d3 which keeps things a bit more flexible as though for example you know there might be a plan of e4 later so after bishop e7 in this position uh, Fisher voluntarily, actually this is quite rare according to live book, he voluntarily gives the bishop up here without waiting for it to be kicked or anything, but he has basically improved his influence of the e5 square. So it is basically Nimzo engine reverse still. Um, knight e5, and now this f pawn is ready to roll to f4 of course. And if black plays something like d4, I think we have e4 at our disposal. In reaction to d4, we can play e4, I believe. Um, so for the moment, black played rook c8. Now knight d2. So now after castles, we see f4. And the rook on its default square is often, you know, a ready-made attack. It's a bit, a bit crude looking. But this kind of thing, if that knight moved, then we'd have also have queen h5. Or the rook can go here. And we have a focal point on g7. So this is uh, an attacking system which is a bit out of book for most people, but it seems rather simple and effective so far. I, I wonder if you would agree with that, that so far uh, it seems simple to play for whites, like a reverse them as an engine. So knight d7 trying to challenge the knight on e5. And now a very direct move is played in this position based on this bishop that's the clue on g7 as white what would you do here very simple move uh, if I let you think about this I'll tell you in a few seconds or you might want to post what you think 
I'll, I'll give you 20 seconds just to think about this. Okay. If any of you have any thoughts, just just say. So white's a move. I hope you've caught up with the, this, and I hope the board's okay. By the way, so white's a move here, very direct move. Uh, this is not an advanced strategy move or anything. Queen Queen G4. Just looking at G7. I know it's pretty cheeky looking, but it has to be addressed now. You know, taking here and then threatening to mate. So we see black uh, playing here. Knight takes E5. Bishop takes e5. Um, and now, okay, so black has to address g7. So he plays bishop f6. And now a very simple rook lift. It's, it's very, very simple, this game so far. It's incredibly simple and outrageously looking simple. I mean, rook f3. Just build up the pressure on g7. It looks simple and effective. I, I think to emulate this though um, in our own games and I know from recent experience that yeah I think you can look at a Fisher game and be really impressed and it looks really simple but I think he's really playing for the strongest move each turn he's not content with any strong move even if it's got good points I think he's looking for the very strongest at every turn he's a perfectionist and we're not so kind of aware how brutally clear you know his moves are you know this this level of perfection or achieving trying to achieve perfection but every single move of Fisher's is kind of accurate yeah the rook f3 here you know in fact it's in d4 maybe there's e4 uh, now queen e7 and the other rook helps so all of white's pieces are very very good there's no bad piece he hasn't created more weaknesses than needed and black seems to be in a rather unpleasant situation actually uh, if black for example here took on e5 then this is a bit of a stranglehold grip on this f4 and this f6 square uh, it doesn't look too pleasant uh, so black played for the moment a5 but now we see just rook g3 and this is carrying a very nasty threat with it uh, which is clearly something like queen takes g7 uh, if black doesn't react to queen takes g7 you know say black played this i think this is going to be very unpleasant taking and probably i should put on an engine a bit before i've totally embarrassed myself um <clears throat> just to make sure but this position taking here check okay so that can't be allowed all right so black after rook g3 uh, probably should play something like g6 is is, is is possible here but black actually played bishop takes e5 this is a bit committal actually bishop takes e5 it isn't it is giving white a grip on that f6 square now i think g6 was a little bit more f fluid okay so with bishop takes e5 f takes uh there is uh something going on here which is extremely unpleasant uh which had to be calculated i guess by fisher but there's something very wrong with this position for black the intended defense uh the intention here is played which is f5 to defend laterally the g7 pawn fisher now plays e takes F. it's got a very nice tactical point here which may be not entirely obvious after rook takes f6 can you see the tactical point in this position which gives white an advantage now an advantage a clear advantage actually if i give you 20 seconds here what would you play with white so 20 seconds starting from now it's actually a neat tactic and to be honest, when I was going over the game, I missed it. I, 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 I'm not, I'm not so attuned tactically in me. So it's good for for tactics. This game, for, you know, basic tactic to um, what would you see in this position as a as a nice tactic, and a culmination actually of of White's whole attack on that G7 square. So White's play here.
Any ideas? I'll just bring up the chat more on play chess as well. So white play here. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. Okay, there is an amazing move. Once you see it, it's simple. That the rook isn't so so solid on g7. This is actually a pin pawn. We have queen takes g7. Check. After here, rook takes f6. And we're hitting this pawn as well. Now we've just netted a pawn. Temporary queen sack, just winning a pawn. Ouch. Oh dear. This has been a disaster for Black against this opening. He's just he's just gone a pawn down against an offbeat opening. I think he must have been a bit annoyed with this. That Fisher's just used anything and got an advantage here. He just won the pawn. How unfortunate. Anyway, so Black at least doubles White's pawns with Queen takes G3 first and now has to nanny the E6 pawn. Okay, so how does Fisher play this position? It would seem tempting uh, to play something like knight f3. I think that's okay. Uh, another move is played here, g4. Okay, and we see a4 from black, and now knight f3. Uh, yeah, so this looks as though it's it's getting a bit uncomfortable with this knight e5 business. Um, now let's see if if e5 i think that's tempting fate you know the pawns can be attacked actually black didn't play e5 for the moment he took on b3 here and king g7 now g5 so the point of g4 revealed just to protect the rook the rook can't be disturbed h6 we just take with the rook not with the pawn of course so there's no h6 we just take with the rook now e5 played here so if black doesn't play e5 then knight e5 does look like a very strong move very nice supports rook f7 can't be tolerated surely so black's prompted to take that e5 square from white but it weakens of course the f5 square weakness of the last move so the knight now jumps to h4 to go to f5 very logical the bishop covers f5 again very logical but it means actually that now the d5 is a bit looser and fisher attack d5 crystal clear moves very very simple looking but what does black do? White is actually increasing his advantage from this offbeat opening. He has to defend that pawn. If black played d4, sorry, the, the then yeah, the bishop's hanging. So there's not too many choices here. Bishop e6 to defend the pawn. King f2, king f7. Now rook b6, so torture with these pawns. The rook defends. Now e4, which marks out that f5 square, fixes down e5. D takes, d takes. So you might argue, well, it's doubled pawns. But the thing is, this rook's very active compared to this rook. It's a much more aggressive rook. And white can build up pressure here with things like knight f5. Surely knight f5 is going to be interesting. Um, or, or moving the king, which, yeah, getting the king towards the center. Okay, so there's torture on the cards now. C4 was played. And Fisher doesn't want to dissolve too many pawns. He actually plays B4 here. Uh, is there much risk? If, if he had taken here, yes. If he reduces the number of pawns, it might somehow increase drawing possibility. Now he wants to keep that pawn. So I think that's more accurate to play B4. Bishop G4. Now Knight F5 might be a, quite a nice move here. It wasn't played just yet. King E3 was played rook d7 as though the rook's going to do something naughty here but fisher's got this covered the knight on the rim is not so dim in this position it supports g6 it can quickly centralize if black took if black dared take we're on the e5 pawn and that would be very unpleasant just to have black played king f8 if he plays takes knight takes we're on e5 how does black defend that e5 pawn it's away from the color of the bishop difficult to defend so 
horrible position king f8 g takes takes back knight g6 is losing e5 it's a lost position now it's gone to a lost position totally just two pawns down for nothing bishop c8 miserable three pawns down and uh, now threatening also knight d6 check king d8 knight d6 rook g7 king comes to defend that g2 pawn just in case king here doesn't help knight takes protects the rook king takes and rook d6 on move 42 <laughs> the answer to life universe and everything uh hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy 42 so rook d6 but uh, yeah that's it fisher used the b3 system to knock out the top i think at the time brazilian player grandmaster very very simple clear-cut game uh it's a wonder you know when you look at games like this can we not play sometimes this offbeat opening it's, it seems very simple like a nimzo engine in reverse i mean the nimzo engine as black to d4 is a very respectable opening so playing it with an extra tempo it seems like on the evidence of this game as well uh, it seems like quite a good idea and fisher did play the nimzo with black quite a bit uh, but this this is a very very sort of easy to play it seems routine maneuvers almost you know uh, to get the queen out then the rook coming out like this and then there's just neat tactic i think black's major issue in in this game was not playing g6 here if he played g6 i think he he wouldn't be losing a pawn and this would be more of a test if if white can get an advantage from this position uh, so this this would be much more testing I think Queen h3 and the game might continue like this and I don't think yeah if white's not getting that pawn then maybe black can hold for a draw it's, it's there's no big problems for black uh, in this position although it looks a bit menacing the rook and queen I think this is defendable in theory but yeah a neat game there in round 21 okay so did anyone get something from this any like the main strategic points or using an offbeat opening with great effect dark square control a combination based on g7 as in the game continuation was a very important tactic here that this defense uh, refuted with this forcing move and a very very powerful forcing move queen takes g7 to win a pawn and then the knights like pretty bad on the dark squares so that forced a further concession and and the rook became very very active and then in the final phase this knight's always like the coordination point is g6 which fisher uses and e5 is very very vulnerable that drops very simple to, you know to play through this game but how many of us could do this i mean it's very very accurate chess so now we're going to look at fisher's basically last tournament game ever in his career last official tournament game because after this tournament it was the candidates matches and then the world championship in 1972 so the next game we're about to look at is fisher's last ever tournament game it was against glagoric great king's engine player glagoric by the way um well respected uh player so he was playing white glagoric was playing white so d4 and for his last tournament game ever we see actually the benoni system being used c5 so e takes c takes d6 knight f3 we have this benoni now white chooses here bishop e2 so it's kind of theoretical so far very theoretical knight d2 a4 knight e5 queen c2 and this is very very popular in live book this position still i mean there's there's over 60 games i mean you know quite popular black doesn't want this knight evicted in a hurry in this position the is a lot about the dark squares 
in the center like in here and having a knight on e5 is is nice sometimes so g5 was played to try and discourage f4 okay and often in this position apparently rook a3 is being used over 70 games but we see now we go we go off book with knight f3 okay so we're out of book now so what does fisher do in this position well okay he doesn't mind an exchange of knights knight takes f3 it is weakening white's control a bit of the dark squares this pawn's hanging right now uh he doesn't necessarily want to play g4 here um so he played h6 it seems a little bit fragile this construction but look at the dark square control it's quite good and in fact there's a celebration of the dark squares coming up in this game which is very interesting uh, we see bishop d2 a6 bishop e2 now queen e7 the queen putting more pressure on e4 we see rook a e1 uh, here I don't think knight takes e4 looks very healthy looking Fisher playing actually queen e5 if he plays knight takes e4 knight takes queen takes runs into a trap bishop d3 ouch because the bishop's holding that rook we've just been skewered ouch that would be losing instantly so no we see instead queen e5 where is the queen going what is it doing on e5 is it trying to encourage f4 from white well fish well sorry the Goric played king h1 here let's let's imagine king h1 wasn't played say f4 then black in this position apparently is doing quite well um or rather white's actually doing okay <laughs> off the check um here this position is actually quite tricky say g4 e5 this this is dangerous it wasn't it wasn't testing he didn't test fisher with this but it seems as though pardon me f4 might be playable here it's strange i think a lot of fisher's opponents um were kind of by this stage of the tournament, i think they were just terrorized of him, of him you know he, he just won several games in a row um so yeah instead of f4 we see rather meek king h1 and in advance of f4 queen d4 now it's it's venturing into the opponent's uh position with now actually the threat of knight takes e4 has been unveiled and so the e pawn is actually supported here uh with f3 but again it seems as though maybe uh f4 might even be possible but f3 fine knight h5 now so emphasizing the grip on all the dark squares it's interesting in this position though I think technically white's doing fine here he hasn't actually done too much wrong so far and in fact there's a good try in this position with white to kind of try and exploit the Queen's position we've seen this in uh, one or two of the earlier games in the tournament it seems Fisher's Queen movements are often that I mean they seem rather provocative some of his queen movements in some of these games and here I mean the provocation here with that green on d4 uh, provoke white into I think a major mistake actually uh, to throw away much of his advantage with the next move what would you play here to try and exploit the queen on d4 uh, it's a very interesting move what was played but uh, it doesn't quite it doesn't work very well to be honest so what would you play with white there's actually a reasonable move to try and exploit the queen here if I give you 20 seconds here with white so you're the white pieces what would you play in this position 20 seconds starting from now
Right, I think knight d1 would be very interesting because it actually it defends b2 and it threatens bishop c3 actually to win the queen because the queen hasn't got e3. This would be a very interesting move, knight d1, and it wasn't played. Um, bishop d7, may, maybe there was a fear of bishop d7, so it's not so simple. Uh, but this, this apparently is a reasonable course. If here, giving up a4, b3, here, knight e3, white could be in good shape here. Say, say this continuation. White would still be, he's got good compensation, it seems. Reasonable compensation. Hitting d6 is the Achilles heel over the Maloney. So that would have been a great continuation uh, for white. Uh, you know, if b5, then we've got, you know, potential pawn mobility. But no, none of this happened. It seems, you know, as I say, Fisher's opponents were a bit terrorized, I think, by him. Anyway, so I think he was over creative in trying to exploit the queen on d4. It's incredible, um, but yeah, he plays knight b5. Knight b5. Hitting the queen and d6. And the point is now a takes, bishop takes b5, hitting the rook. Now if the rook moves, if the rook moves here, then bishop c3 wins the queen. The queen has nowhere to run to it's it's one there's no a4 or anything so that's the point but it, it backfires here this this whole concept backfires it's not the strongest move and it backfires Fisher did just snap it off and in this position why does it backfire this concept what is what is black play in this position it's just be material up so black to play here what would you play with black Any ideas? Uh, so your rooks attacked, and there's also this bishop c3. So two threats that you've got to deal with with one move. Yep. Yep. Queen e5. Queen e5. Protects e8. And even f4 suppressed with that knight on the rim there. That's a pretty useful knight on the rim there. They're not always dim. The knight on the rim is dim is, is not right here. Otherwise, okay. So bishop c3 and the queen just drops back. Bishop takes e8. Queen takes e8. Bishop takes g7. King takes g7. Uh, here, if... I don't think knight takes g7 makes too much of a difference just yet. King takes. Okay. So bishop and knight against rook, a rook. White has seemingly solid pawn structure though. Seven pawns here against the six. And he has a striking point in this c5 pawn, which he uses now. b4, so it's pretty dangerous this position and of course this king on the diagonal I mean he could have played knight takes but king is prone to checks now I think b3 um, as in other rounds of tournament there's a specific tactical weakness which some players seem to be falling into against Fisher. white played rook f2 which is a mistake and I wonder what would you do to punish this rook f2. There's a slight weakness of the last move tactically, which can be exploited with brutal forcing moves. Very high accuracy. Uh, so fish is a bit like a computer. It's like playing against a computer. So as black, what would you play in this position? So black to play, if I give you 20 seconds here, what would you play in this position? That's a really crushing move, actually. 
And that's it spells the end of the game. It's his last. Yeah. Okay. It's it's a shocker. Yeah. The knight d3, which seems to be covered, is not covered anymore. This weakness for the last move is this back row. The queen's actually got access to the back row, and this makes this tactic possible. Knight d3. Ouch. That fork is now possible. Because if rook takes, this wasn't played. Queen takes was played. If rook takes, we have queen a1 check. And there's nothing defending the back row. It's embarrassing. Yeah, Fisher's last tournament game. Knight d3. He teaches us the power of forcing moves. The, if you look at these, this game and the previous game, it's the power of forcing moves, which we can win a lot of points in our own games. I'm pretty sure. Um, you know what can the opponent do here? He's losing more material. So queen takes. He's just a whole bishop down now. He's a whole bishop down. The game doesn't last too long after this. I know today's like modern grandmaster games, they're more positional. It, it's like a, yeah, he didn't offer much resistance. Glagoric didn't offer much resistance. The rook comes to the second rank here. And there's actually a, a killer threat here actually with this. It's it's not just casually glancing at, at G2. Black has got a specific um, killer threat. So white played queen g3 here. I know black's a bishop up, so it's a bit academic. But say white played rook c1. What crushing move has black got available here? What what would you play in this position? Black to play here. This this is just a what if rook c1. I know I know black's bishop. Black's winning anyway. But uh, there's a crushing move here. Yeah, yeah, Bishop H3. So we can like get this, or uh, that's that's unpleasant. Well, there's a false mate here in three actually. Check, and if here, check, mate. So yeah, Bishop H3. So White tried Queen G3. It's hopeless. Anyway, I believe he's addressed the Bishop H3. Queen B2 now was played so keeping the pressure on g2 h4 now actually just rook a1 and you know he's a bishop up so it doesn't matter really now uh, white resigns if, if he takes okay we can come back with our queen basically to defend and we're a bishop up and defend d6 as well by the way so no prospects so yeah white uh, just resigned after rook a1 so again, Fisher made it look quite easy, and it's kind of the opening <laughs> seems really simple. If you if you look at this opening, it's incredibly kind of it it looks pretty simple and tactical. The the, the pressure it creates is easily understood like on the e file at some level. Anyway, it's easily understood tactical pressure from this pawn structure. There isn't a fantastic positional sophistication about the game. The dark squares. In, in some respects um, but uh, yeah the Queen I mean the Queen movement is interesting it's like he's teasing his opponents uh, to have to work hard to try and refute this you know Queen Queen d4 I mean I think this is this is quite quite difficult to refute so Knight b5 but Knight d1 as mentioned the problems arise you have to calculate Bishop d7 and if, if b3 then the Queen's actually unpunished um, I think the queen could just just go back, and it's created some weaknesses, and we can wait more on the, on the dark squares. I think I think that's the point, maybe that the, you know the queen maybe anticipating going back, but yeah, is 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 just um, yeah. Otherwise, this I mean this needs a long calculation, as I mentioned. Uh, this this kind of thing uh, that it's a classic recipe actually against the only to target d6, but. Uh, uh, actually, black would be better there. No, the, the actual the actual thing going on here. Bishop c3 taking b3 has it needed total precision to try and get an advantage from what Fisher played. Anyway, that's the point. 
and it wasn't played like that instead we see this knight b5 uh, which just just uh, got a slight material disadvantage but it was the howler later with the back row issue which some opponents in previous rounds had fallen victim to to basic tactics on the back row but fish is like a hawk tactically with the forcing moves so yeah one wrong move and you're dead knight d3 and that really is over it's like a bishop up okay now the next game is one of the shortest fisher games in round 23 okay and yeah okay so round 23 this is not a long game at all i assure you uh so i wanted to keep these sessions with a particular tournament i was tempted to show you another game from another tournament but we'll carry on um after this is a short game but i'll give some background to it and um I don't really consider this Fisher's last real tournament game. I've considered this one against Gregoric Fisher's last tournament game. So this game, <laughs> Fisher was white. I think it was after ten minutes he waited. He played c4, which he rarely plays against Oscar Pano. And the game had been arranged. 7 p.m. apparently when all the other games were being played at four and um, apparently the the organizer Max Erver a former world champion Max Erver had wanted you know the Russians asked the Russians and other players would would they all be wanting to play at seven and they didn't want to play at seven so this is the only game being played at 7 p.m. and Oscar Pano didn't really like that and it was for religious region uh, <laughs> reasons um, I think Fisher's joined some sort of Church of God or something. I'm not actually. You should really check Wiki on this. But uh, yeah, so he tried to get this game played at seven. Pano uh, was in his hotel. So after um, ten minutes, I think Fisher went to try and get Pano from his hotel, Oscar Pano, and um, I think Pano resigned remotely uh, about forty-five minutes in. Of the allotted hour, the the default was one hour. I think it was about forty five minutes in. He resigned remotely. I don't think he came back to the building. He just resigned the game. So that concludes uh, Palma de Mallorca, nineteen seventy. So Fisher won convincingly, several points ahead of the nearest rivals. And with this tournament, he qualified for the candidates, of course, and. His first player to meet in the candidates would be Mark Timonov, who was uh, well known as a pianist. Uh, so he had his music as well as his chess. So Mark Timonov, um, who regarded Fisher, I think apparently said something like Fisher's like a computer or something, maybe for his accuracy. And he didn't really think he was going to lose that match. I think he thought he was the favourite Timonov. And as a background to this, it seems Mikhail Botvinnik was making comments that even though Fisher had won lots of games in a row, he wasn't necessarily a genius. Uh, so I think at this point, after winning this tournament, the Russians weren't uh, publicly saying he was a genius, but I think Botvinnik was helping in preparations with Mark Timonov for that Fisher match which we're going to check, start checking in the next two weeks. So we'll check f the first three games of that six game match next week and three after that. So that's that's the candidates match, which we'll look at next week against Mark Timonov. Uh, so there's six games there. Um, yeah, so, okay, we're 40 minutes in now. I think I'm going to conclude early um, because as I say, I want to keep these events uh, separate. So I hope you got something from the two games. They demonstrate very powerful tactics and accuracy, I think, the two meaty games looked at here. Okay, so yeah, comments or questions on YouTube. Okay, so see you next week for the match against Mark Timonov. We're going to have a look at that next week. Thanks very much.